Okay, well, my name is Tom, and I've put together this little lecture on rocket science, and I hope to give a, a soup-to-nuts presentation of rocket science, um, highlighting the things that I think are really interesting about it and why it's just such a fascinating discipline and can be a really fascinating career. Um, the curriculum will very loosely follow the requirements for the Civil Air Patrol in this case module four so this this is all about rocketry then there's one on solar systems and one on space which I'll do later but uh, I'm not going to focus as much on the trivia of the history as I think that curriculum does and uh, I will touch all I think all everything you need to know to pass the written test though and uh, I, I'd you know I think this is such a fascinating subject the term rocket scientist is one of those loaded terms that, that always gets a smile on somebody's face when, when you tell them that you're a rocket scientist. One time when I was buying a car and I was negotiating with the, the salesperson at the dealership and he says, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see how great of a deal this is. And I said, no, wait, I am a rocket scientist. So it's just a phenomenal you know, topic and I get very excited about it. Hopefully I can contain my enthusiasm. Um, and also debunk a lot of things that I think are misconceptions about the whole thing. So this is a brief outline. I'll just kind of launch in. Unfortunately, in video, there's no such thing as indexing. So you're going to have to, I think if you just, you know, use a little fast forward or, or uh, move the cursor, you can kind of go to whatever topic. I'll, I'll check them off or circle them as I, as I get to them. So the first thing I want to talk about is rockets versus space. Now, for some reason, these topics always go together, and it's assumed that you that rockets and space are like, you know, different aspects of the same problem. They're really not. They're completely different. So first of all, there are a lot of uses for rockets that have nothing to do with space, right? So, you know, there's, we have another term for rockets that don't go into space. We call them missiles. And in fact, the first, you know, rocketry started, I think, according, you know, by the Greeks in, in uh, 400 BC. It wasn't until 1957 that we actually put anything into orbit, right? The Soviets put something into orbit. Now, the U.S. could have, I'll talk about that. The U.S. actually could have put something into orbit earlier, but they chose not to for very important international relations reasons. But missiles are rockets that do not go into space. So, and then you can have rocket-powered cars, rocket-powered boats, all kinds of things. So there's, just because we're talking about rockets does not mean that we actually have to be talking about trying to go into space. The second thing is, and this is a big one, being in space is not the same thing as being in orbit, right? Even there, the first launch from the Soviets of, of Gagarin, the first launch from the United States of Shepard, Neither of those guys were in orbit. They were in space, which means, uh, you know, we have a definition for space. And uh, I think the, the U.S. Air Force back in the, in the 60s or the 50s decided that anyone who went more than 50 miles in altitude was entitled to wear astronaut wings. Well, what they did is they took their pilot wings that had a little... Uh, these vertical bars and swapped it out for something that had like a space logo in it. Now those those guys were not in rockets, right? Well, they were probably in, in rockets, but those were things like the X-15 and some of those other vehicles in, in that in that time frame, suborbital. So by being in space, that just means that you've you've gone outside the atmosphere. And I think people generally use 50 miles as a, uh, a metric for sort of where does the atmosphere end. If you looked at the, the atmosphere versus altitude, what you would find is it kind of goes like this. So it's not so you really get out maybe to 100 miles that you really totally uh, is, is, gotten out of any molecules of atmospheric gas and what have you. 
but people generally call it at 50 miles that you're outside the atmosphere for all practical purposes. Now, if you go to the top of Mount Everest, you've already used up half the atmosphere, so that means you have like half the oxygen, half everything. Um, being in orbit, being in orbit is like a thousand more times more difficult than being in space. It's easy to get into space. Amateurs go into space with rockets. You know, all these modern, uh, that Spaceship One, the Burt Rutan thing, and some of these other, well, there's a whole host now of, of um, essentially entertainment-based companies that are doing, that are going to be doing these uh, flights into space. Those people are going into space. That is not the same thing as going into orbit. You know, in fact, the whole X Prize was about being able to go into a commercial venture, go into space, the same vehicle twice within some period of short period of time, which is a, a challenging and, and certainly a, a great accomplishment. But those guys did not go into orbit. They went into space. Going into orbit is like a thousand times more difficult. And that's why it took so long until that finally happened. Now, we'll talk in the physics section about why, why it is that going into orbit is so difficult. And now let's talk a little bit about what is a rocket. Well, a rocket is something that spews out something, right? So, typically you see a rocket drawn with some kind of thing like this. There's something coming out the back. And that's what makes it a rocket. Now, what, when the Chinese started out, they were just using gun, they were burning gunpowder. So this is some kind of a, the, you know, the gases and, the, and the, uh, the results of that combustion would fly out the back. And that would then propel the rocket forward. We'll talk about the Newton's laws, which govern why that happens. But uh, being a rocket is where you're throwing something out the back, as, can, as opposed to a propeller-driven vehicle, where all you're doing is kind of stirring the air and then taking advantage of the density of the air to kind of push yourself against the air. So let's just say a few more words about that. Why is it? Well, let's go. Let's just start into our. We'll launch into our history section. So the first people to ever do anything that we would consider a rocket were the Greeks, and some Greek fellow whose name is uh, Hero of Alexander made a little device, and what it was was it, it was it was these two things that spun on a central axle. And each of these things, let me try to, was a little, uh, a little steam chamber with a nozzle. So if you heat, so they put hot steam and hot water in here, and I don't know how they heated it. They might have actually had a little uh, fire going here. But anyway, steam was coming out here. And the same thing was true on the other side. And the net result was the whole thing then rotated. It went like that. So that was the first ever use of a principle of a rocket, where this we were throwing they were throwing steam out the back, and that's what propelled this thing to spin. So then we get to the Chinese, and what the Chinese did is they put gunpowder into some kind of a tube, a, a, a container. So if the container is strong enough and it's closed, enclosed, then when you start to burn the gunpowder, well, the process of combustion generates heat. It generates these byproducts, the, the gases and what have you, and they want to go somewhere. So if the whole thing is contained, then the, the products of combustion only have one place to go, which is out the back. And so that's why burning gunpowder gun inside of a tube gives you a rocket. We're sending the gases out the back. Now, those, all those rockets that people launch as kids, you know, I used to play with those when I was a kid. I think those use some variation on gunpowder as the propellant. It's not really gunpowder. You can't, it doesn't have the same properties. I'm sure it's a lot safer, <laughs> among other things, than gunpowder. But it's the same concept. So the Chinese had these rockets with gunpowder, and then they, somebody said, well, now wait, why don't we attach one of these rockets to an arrow? So they had the rocket, a long arrow, and then they, they strapped a rocket on the side of it. And then they'd light the rocket and shoot the arrow 
and the rocket would propel the arrow a lot farther than you could just shoot it with a bow. And notice, you know, it's almost serendipitously, notice how they had this long stick on here. What, the effect of this stick was to give guidance. So having the long stick gave the thing more stability so that it would continue on a, a predictable and, and, you know, trajectory so you could aim it. Now it's interesting, how did they launch these things? Did they actually launch them with a bow and arrow? Well imagine I had my bow and arrow, and then I have the arrow here, and then I ignite my, my rocket strapped onto the arrow. Well that, where's all that exhaust gas and combustion going to go? Right in my face. So you can't launch a rocket propelled arrow from a bow like you would a normal one. So they had to invent some other system. I think they had a little tray. It was like a... A, tr a trough with a, you know, I think a V-shaped cross section, and they put the the arrow in that, and they had the rocket on it, and then they launched it from this tray, and then they used that. The Chinese and the Mongols were using rockets against one another in some war that they had in, I think, like the 12th century or something like that. Now the next, so you know, it's interesting that rocketry. Up until modern times, rocketry was essentially considered a discipline for wackos, you know, for people for people who who did these rocketry experiments and what have you were considered to be kind of nuts. And and, and it's only uh, it's only in modern times that it's really become a a science, and now it's become a huge science and a huge engineering field. But this fellow Froissart, this French guy, in, decided observed that if you launch the the projectile, the rocket from a tube, you could do better than if you just launched it from a tray. So he's, his, his claim to fame was the tube, the launch tube. Now notice in the days of modern rockets, we don't use the launch tube, we just have the, the vehicle just sits on the pad and then just takes off. Then there was this uh, Russian guy, Tsiolkovsky, as far as I can tell, the correct pronunciation is Tsiolkovsky. And, um, he had had a couple of major observations. First of all, the idea of using staging. So, the, you know, if you have this big rocket, if you want to go as high as possible or as far as possible, you have this rocket, and then once a piece of it is used up, you throw it away, and then you have less to continue on. So, you, as you use it up, you kind of throw it away piece by piece. We call that staging, and we'll talk about that in more detail in the engineering section. He also, Tsiolkovsky, also was the first person to propose a liquid propellant. And we'll talk about that in more detail also, but notice, notice how these gunpowder-based rockets were essentially solid rockets. The propellant inside was solid, and then you just light it and it goes. A liquid engine, you have the different pieces and you, then you combine them in a con combustion chamber. It turns out liquids are a lot more efficient, they generate more thrust, and, and uh, that's why all the big vehicles use liquid. Uh, then there's this guy, Spencer, a British guy, and his claim to fame is spin stabilization. So, you know, imagine, you know, put yourself, in, in retrospect, to go back and kind of give this little laundry list of who did what, it's sort of, uh, you know, it makes sense. Imagine you were put yourself in that situation at that time. Okay, let's build a rocket. Well, what's a rocket? You know, all we know is that if we burn gunpowder, it'll shoot something off. We want it to go further, so we want something that's more powerful, and we want it to go straighter, so we want something that's going to be more guided. And so that's what kind of fueled a lot of these things. So Spencer observed that if you have the actual vehicle spinning on its, on its longitudinal axis, right? So you have, let me kind of clean up my cartoons here. So spin stabilization, we have the vehicle, and then down here, the, the engine, rather than going and firing straight back, it fires back at a slight angle, and you have to have more than one 
motor to balance it out. So we have one going that way, and then on the other side there's one going this way. The net result is that it, it induces a, uh, a bending moment, you know, a torque on the vehicle. And so then the vehicle, as it ascends, it rotates. And then that gives it st stability. Now, why does spinning something give it stability, right? Why is it that when you are riding a bicycle, it's a lot easier to stay vertical than standing still on a bicycle? Well, it's because your tires are rotating when you're moving, and they give you spin stabilization. Now, what's the physical property that goes with spin stabilization? It's called gyroscopic stiffness. Right, and that's the same thing that applies in any kind of a gyroscopic guidance instrument. A top, a spinning top, a spinning dreidel, bicycle wheels that keep you vertical, or keeping this rocket going along that one direction. You get gyroscopic stiffness. It's, a, it's like you had some kind of pressure. As the thing wants to go out of its straight flight, there's actually a, like a force that's pushing it back into straight flight. That's what's meant by gyroscopic stiffness. So that's the way that would work. Now, what if you launch something and you want it to go a distance? So here we have the Earth, the ground, and we launch our rocket. And we want to hit a target. We want to hit a target over here. Well, so we're going to have the thing take some kind of a trajectory like that. Now, now there is a nose cone in this thing, right? It is pointed in the front, so that's going to you know, cause it to have less drag if it flies with the point, pointed nose first. But what's the general, if you have a spin-stabilized vehicle, what's the, what's the attitude, you know, what's the position, the attitude of that vehicle going to be like as it goes to hit the target. Well, it's spinning, right? So it's, you know, let's say we get the spinning going and it's like in this, aligned along this axis when it starts flying. Well, it's spinning, even though it's on a trajectory, it's going to stay spinning like that. It's stabilized, right? You know, stabilization. It's going to stay spinning like that until it hits the target, right? It's not going to take, it's not going to take some clean path where the tip, the point hits first. Now, if it's a bomb, does that really matter? No, because the whole thing's going to blow up anyway, so it's, it's irrelevant. But the thing's going to maintain that same attitude all the way through its flight. Right? Although, if it, if it did not, then spin stabilization would actually be, would have failed, right? We would have not had spin stabilization if, it, if, it, if the attitude changed. Now, we'll talk about in the part, in the next video on what do you do once you're in space or in orbit, we'll talk about the opposite from a satellite or a space vehicle of spin stabilization, because we do have satellites that are spin stabilized. In fact, we build satellites today, primarily communication satellites that are spin stabilized. The, op the opposite of that is called three axis stabilization. So a three axis stabilized vehicle, what we do is there are, gyro there are um, flywheels, one along each axis of, of uh, the attitude. So there's one in the pitch direction, the roll direction, and the yaw direction. And these flywheels, by moving them, then the vehicle takes the opposite direction, and that's how we maintain a particular orientation or, or attitude. So spin stabilization versus three axis. But that's three axis was probably not even implemented on any vehicle until, uh, well, I would guess maybe into, even into the 70s.